So we're at lecture 11. This is good. And today we're going to prove the John Nirenberg inequality. And we're not going to do anything else. If it ends up being a short lecture, then it ends up being a short lecture. There's no point in trying to cram more into this. We may as well focus on, on John Nirenberg today because it's, it's, it's a nice proof. It's multi-step. It's, it it's lemmas upon lemmas and everything builds up and it. it's quite a nice proof. It's not a simple one. And yeah, I'm worried that I'm going to lose everybody halfway through the proof just because there's, you know, a couple of steps. And I'm not the best at explaining this sort of proof because I can't, I'm not an expert in this proof, right? I can't say I have all of this proof in my brain. I'm hoping that by teaching it, I can get it in there and maybe you can also understand it better. So just to recall, the reason we're proving John Nirenberg, before I say what John Nirenberg is, because you've forgotten, we want to prove the kahan kinchin inequality. And what the kahan kinchin inequality is, it says that when you take a Rada marker average and you take this average in LP, then it's equivalent to taking the average in LQ. And this is for all P and Q. And I'm stating it between one and infinity, but you can actually go all the way down to zero, not including zero, once you've formulated that appropriately. I just don't want to talk about quasi Barnack, you know, Bochner spaces or anything like that. But if you check, you check the proof, you'll see that there's no actual requirement that P and Q are greater than one here. You can go less than that. And occasionally that's useful, but not in this course, I don't think. So this is the Kahan Kinchin inequality. This is what we want to prove. I need to make the, the definitions again that we need for the John Nirenberg inequality just so we haven't forgotten everything. We're taking X to be a Barnack space. We have a probability space with a filtration. No particular assumptions on all of these things, just abstract Barnack space, abstract filtration, whatever. And we have F, which is an X valued stochastic process. Uh, adapted to the filtration. We're not assuming that F is a martingale or anything like that. There's no assumptions on F at all, other than adaptedness to the filtration. So Fn is An measurable for all N. We defined this weird measure of oscillation, star Q, for lack of a better name, which was the supremum over all K and N with K less than or equal to N. Also the supremum over all A in the sigma algebra A sub K, restricted to the sets of positive measure. We look at the average over A. So of course we need to have positive measure of A to be able to divide by its measure here. We look at the difference between Fn and Fk minus one. For technical reasons, we have Fk minus one, not Fk. So we're integrating that in LQ. So it's an LQ average. Yeah, uh, yep. And you can think a bit about this, this quantity here. If the filtration is regular enough, then you can replace Fk minus one with Fk. Um, if F is a martingale, then you have this nice interpretation that this is actually an oscillation because in that nice regular case, you're taking Fn and you're comparing it with the average over the set that you're integrating on. So it's legitimately an LQ average of the oscillation. But in general, it's not. In general, it's just this thing here. And the John Nirenberg theorem for stochastic processes at least is that this measure of oscillation in Q is equivalent to the same thing with P instead of Q. Let's 
for all P and Q. And as I said on Thursday, the way that we deduce Kahn Kinshin from this is by realizing these, these Rada marker averages as exactly these quantities here for a particular choice of F. That'll take some more derivation. We'll do that on Thursday, but for now we'll just prove John Nuremberg. Uh, before I get into the proof, does anybody have any concerns or questions about these definitions? Does anybody want me to slow down and repeat some stuff? Is anybody too confused? Everyone's okay. Good. So the way we prove this just in a very hand wavy and maybe not very informative way is that we, we look at the oscillation of F in various different forms and piece by piece, we just get more and more information about this oscillation. We build up what we know about the oscillation and then in the end, we can finally prove this. We're going to use a bunch of stopping time arguments. We're going to use a bit of Doob's maximal operator, all this nice stuff, very probabilistic sort of proof, but not really using anything deeper than stopping times, which we, I think, know, or at least we've seen them before. So in all of the following lemmas, I'm not going to bother quantifying over X or F. We're just, we're working with this, whoops. Don't want to erase that. We're working with this X, this F, this probability space and so on. I don't want to repeat that every time or it'll take too long. So let's begin with the first lemma, lemma one. This isn't the numbering that I'm using in the notes. It's just, you know, local numbering. I'm going to have lemma one, two, three, and four today. And we're never going to reference them again. So we start with lemma one. Good place to start. Lemma one says that when you've got K less than or equal to N, and when you have A in A sub K, and you have a scale T greater than zero, then the probability of the set A intersect the set where Fn minus Fk minus one is greater than T. So this is the measure of a, a set A intersect where the oscillation is larger than T in a sense, considering this thing here as an oscillation. This probability is less than or equal to uh, the, the star Q measure of oscillation that I defined divided by T, everything to the power Q times the probability of A. This is lemma one, nice and simple. No additional assumptions, this is just true in general. Uh, the proof is a one-liner if you, yeah, if you have a long line. It doesn't even need to be that long. For the proof, we can assume without loss of generality that A is actually in AK plus, as in A's got positive measure, because if A's got measure zero, then the right-hand side's zero, and so it's left-hand side, and there's nothing to show. Right, we may as well just assume that right off the bat. And then we compute. We don't use anything too heavy here. So the first thing we notice is that this probability is less than the, the integral over A of Fn minus Fk minus one. Oh, there we go. Divided by T to the power Q. Uh, if you don't see this immediately, that's because the probability of this set is equal to the integral of this set of the function one. And this thing here is greater than or equal to one on that set because of how the set's constructed. This difference is greater than T. So the difference divided by T is greater than one. And if I, if I take that to the cube power, that's still greater than one. I integrate that over a subset of A. And in particular, that's smaller than integrating that over A. <laughs> because A is larger than that subset of A. That's a very crude estimate, but it works. It's good enough. So now I can take that T out of the integral because T doesn't depend on omega at all. T is just a constant. 
uh, I write this integral over a as an average over a of this difference. And in this average over a, what I'm doing is dividing by the probability of a. So I need to compensate for that. I need to put that probability back to make this equality hold. And this here, this average LQ oscillation, these are the quantities that appear in that oscillation measure. So the supremum over all k less than or equal to n, we've assumed k is less than or equal to n. The supremum over a and ak plus, and we do have a and ak plus of this thing to the power one on q is exactly this star q measure of f. So this particular instance is less than that supremum or equal to. And we get the result. So you can put divide by t, everything's to the qth power here. And we have the probability of a. That's lemma one. Lemma one is pretty straightforward. So what's it telling us? It's telling us that on each set in AK, the, the super level measure of this oscillation is controlled by this constant here, which we're going to work with later. In particular, if T gets very large, this tells you how this decays as T gets large. That's what's going to be important here. We have this one on T appearing here, T in the denominator. And we're going to forget what lemma one is eventually, but we'll come back to it. But actually, I do need to highlight one thing. This, this Fn term here. What we're going to do in the next lemma is generalize lemma one to general stopping times. And you might ask, well, what the stopping times have to do with lemma one? You should think of lemma one as being a statement about the constant stopping time n. Think of k as being fixed. And then think of the constant stopping time n, which is greater than k. And it tells you what happens when you stop f at that time. We're going to generalize it to more general stopping times. Now, lemma two looks a bit like lemma one, but it takes a somewhat different form. In lemma two, instead of just proving something universally, like we proved in lemma one, we're going to start with a condition. We're going to say, suppose that there exists uh, t greater than zero and a constant c greater than zero. I'm writing it as a capital C in my notes, but I think I should really write it as a small c because you want to think of c as small. Suppose there exists t and c. Such that this probability, the same thing we were looking at in lemma one, is less than or equal to that constant c times the probability of a. Suppose that this holds. Lemma one does say that this holds actually for a certain t for all t and certain c's depending on t. In lemma two, we suppose that it holds. And we want it for all k less than or equal to n. I'm going to write it as for all n greater than or equal to k because we should think of k as fixed and n as being the thing that's varying. So for all n with this property, for all a and a k. then we can sort of bootstrap this to more general stopping times. So for all k, for all a in a k, and for all stopping times t, such that t is greater than or equal to k on a. Remember that a stopping time is a random variable. It's not a constant. And it has this property that the, the set where the stopping time is less than or equal to n is a n measurable for each n. We'll see that in the proof. So if all stopping time is greater than or equal to k on a, you have this probability estimate here. Probability of a intersect the set where the stopping time is finite 
stopping times can be infinite. That's allowed. Intersect where f of t minus f of k minus 1 is greater than not t, but 2t. We, we lose a little bit in this estimate. It's less than or equal to 2c times the probability of a. So we lose a little bit here in two ways. We lose something on the scale and we lose something on the constant. And what is this f sub t? It's a stochastic process where, well, no, it's a random variable, sorry. And at omega, it is f of t of omega of omega. Right. And we don't need to, if t can be infinity, but we don't need to say what we mean by f sub infinity because we're only looking at the set where t is less than infinity anyway. This is not going to be a problem. Let's prove it. Uh, this is a pretty standard technique when you're dealing with stopping times, this proof. You sum over all the possible values of the stopping time. And for a fixed value, you end up looking at not a, a variable stopping time, but a constant stopping time, just a constant n. And we know things about, we, we know the analogous statement of this lemma for constant stopping times. In fact, that's what we're assuming. It's a matter of putting everything together. So let's start. So we write this probability as a, as a limit, as capital N goes to infinity of the sum from small n going from k to n. So we're summing over all the possible values of the stopping time on A. The stopping time is greater than or equal to k on A. So we only go from k to infinity. And just to make everything rigorous, I'm going to write it as k to capital N and take the limit as capital N goes to infinity. The probability of the set A sub N, which I'll define, but you can probably guess what that is. Intersect where the oscillation is large. Of course, A N is the set A intersect T equals N. So the subset of A where T equals N. Okay, now what do we do? Let's fix a capital N greater than N, greater than K. Do I want greater than or equal to here? I probably do, let's not. Let's look at a particular sum here. Let's fix n and n and k and so on. Um, yeah. So what do I want to do here? Here's where it gets a little bit tricky. So let's do it slowly. So the first thing we do is split this set into two parts using the triangle inequality over here. We say this is less than the probability of a n intersect the set where f n minus f capital N is greater than 2t, 2t not t, plus the probability of a n intersect the set where f capital N minus fk minus one is greater than 2t. This is just it's a fairly standard thing you can do. It's a consequence of the triangle inequality. That's why this two appears out the front. Um, if you haven't seen this before, if this oscillation is large, then because this oscillation is less than or equal to this oscillation plus that oscillation, one of those two has to be large as well. Is that how this works? Yes, something like that. And now how can we use this? We do nothing with the second term for now. We just look at the first one. We write Fn as Fn plus one minus one, because that's just how things are gonna have to work. 
we look at our assumption, we know something about these sets when we look at something of the form Fn minus Fk minus one, when we're on a set that's in Ak. Now we're on this set An. An is in the sigma algebra An, and that is in the sigma algebra An plus one. And N, capital N, is greater than N. So this first probability here, we can actually estimate using the hypothesis, using the assumption. This is controlled by a constant times the probability of a n. This is the way of going from a, a non-constant stopping time to, to an assumption on a constant stopping time, the constant stopping time n, for capital N, and capital N is larger than, than k, or well, larger than n here. So we do that and we do nothing to the second set. You might ask, why don't we do the same thing on the second set? It looks like it's of the same form. The problem is we don't know whether a n is in the sigma algebra a k. n's greater than or equal to k. So a n is in the sigma algebra a n that might not be in the sigma algebra a k. So the assumption doesn't apply to this second set. Alex, sorry to interrupt you, but Calvin put a message in the chat. Oh, by all means, interrupt me. Isn't it T on two? That makes more sense. That certainly makes more sense than two T. Um, <laughs> yeah, what am I doing? Am I doing it backwards here? Ah, I see what I've done wrong. Yeah. Whoops. You're right that I made a mistake, but the location of my mistake was a different spot. Um, I started with 2t and then I replaced 2t with t for some reason. So I should have had t from the beginning here. So 2t. This is 2t. And then I divide by 2. That's right. I don't go from t to 2t. I go from t to t on 2. <laughs> If this thing is greater than t, then these two things that sum up to one of them has to be greater than t on two, or otherwise the sum is less than t. That makes more sense. Thanks. T, t. <laughs> yeah. Actually, this is just a mistake in my notes that I blindly copied out thinking, yeah, this makes sense. Very good. That's why I couldn't quite think of it. All right. Everyone happy with that? That's a lot better. It's actually true now. 2t and t on 2 are roughly the same thing, right? Up to a constant, all good. That's what happens when you think of everything up to a constant. Anyway, we're up to here. So we can't do anything with the second set at the moment because this set isn't, the set a n is not in a sigma algebra that would permit us to use our assumption. But anyway, we continue. So we can look at this limit. n from k up to capital N. This probability. Now this is less than or equal to the limit of, now we look at the individual terms in the sum and we see that we can split it into two as we did before and we can estimate the first one. So we get constant times the sum, the constant C, not just any constant, it's constant C probability of an plus another sum of terms that we didn't quite know how to deal with. Like that. And now we see that the second term that we couldn't do anything with is actually nice because, well, not the whole thing, but because the set we're intersecting with here is independent of n. Okay, obviously the set AN is not, but you're looking at AN intersect something that's independent of N and the ANs are disjoint, so you're going to be able to sum them up. So what's this? This is less than or equal to the constant C times the probability of A, because this first term, you can just sum them up. AN is A intersect T equals N, so you look at all the possible values of T. This is a petition of A. 
it's actually a partition of a subset of A. So that's the probability is less than that of A. You get the limit as n goes to infinity of the probability of A. Same argument as before. Intersect where this oscillation is large. And now we know that the set A is in the sigma algebra A sub K. That was what we assumed from the beginning, I think. I hope. Did we assume that? Yes, we did. Good. So now we can apply the assumption. The trick was we had to sum up all of the subsets A n to get something that was that we knew was in the right sigma algebra. So now we get two times that constant C times the probability of A. Um, because I sort of skipped the step here. Let's write it as this. Each one of these probabilities here is itself less than the probability of A, independently of capital N. That's part of our hypothesis, actually. See, this is true for all N greater than or equal to K, but there's no N on the right-hand side. Anyway, that's how the proof of lemma two works. So just to remind ourselves of what, what we've done, we have this stochastic process. Lemma one says we can estimate the oscillation of Fn minus Fk minus one for each N on particular sets. Lemma two says, given that estimate or given an estimate of that form for constant stopping times N, you can bootstrap it to a slightly weaker but similar estimate for general stopping times. That's, and this is surprisingly powerful. Any questions before lemma three? No, okay. So for lemma three, we're gonna need a little bit of notation that we haven't introduced yet. standard in stochastic processes, but we haven't done it yet. We need what's called the process started at K minus one. So we have our stochastic process F and there's an associated stochastic process with horrible notation. It's denoted like this with a superscript on the left. I cannot stand superscripts on the left, but this is standard. So we deal with it. The process started at K minus one it's a stochastic process given by Fn minus Fk minus one, N going from K minus one to infinity. So the first term is zero. And from then on, it's just given by the differences of Fn and the place where you started. And we're gonna use the dude maximal operator, which I introduced a while back. And this has this started process has do maximal function M of annoying superscript K minus one F dot. So remember just by definition, this is the supremum over all N. In this case, it's N greater than K minus one because that's where our process starts. Now this is for a, a given omega. It's a supremum over all of these values of the process. And for this particular process, that's the supremum of n greater than k, because when n equals k, it's zero. I've written n greater than or equal to k in my notes, so I may as well. n equals k does nothing here. Fn minus f k minus one omega. And these terms appear in our arguments, so you can see, yeah, this is gonna be relevant to us. So let's do lemma three. Do we have time for lemma three? Yes, we do. Lemma three has got the same form as lemma two. We suppose an estimate, which is gonna be the output of lemma two, and we get a new estimate. Suppose that we have this estimate Uh, 
let's do this with 2t less than or equal to 2c probability of a. Suppose we have this for some t and c. Not all t, just some t. And we want this to hold for all k, for all a and a k, and for all stopping times t with t greater than or equal to k on a. So this is the kind of estimate that we got as the output of lemma 2. We suppose we have such an estimate. Then what do we get? We get for all s greater than zero, for all k in n, and for all a in a k, we get a new estimate, estimates upon estimates, except this is an estimate for the super level set of the maximal function. of the process started at k minus one. We have s plus two t. So t is this scale we, oh, headphone came out. t is the scale we assumed had this estimate. And we get this estimate super level sets of s of scale s plus two t for all s. Maybe you want to think of this as two t plus s for all s, whatever works for you. This is less than two c times another thing of the same form. Same maximal operator on the right hand side, but now we have the super level set with scale s instead of s plus 2t. And what is this telling us? It's telling us that the, the set where the maximal function is, is large, you should think of c as being small here. It tells you that the the measure of the set where the maximal function is large decays quite quickly, actually decays exponentially. Because if you have it at a certain level at a certain scale and you boost up that scale by 2t, you will get some sort of exponential decay. Where thinking of c as small, it's like a geometric decay, you should say, right? This measure is getting progressively, quite rapidly smaller and smaller as the scale increases. And yeah, we have time to prove this before the break, I'm pretty sure. Let's fix K. Fix K and A. And let's define some stopping times. We have an assumption that holds for all stopping times and we have a conclusion that has no stopping times involved. So we're gonna to have to pull out some stopping times from somewhere. S is the infimum of n greater than or equal to k such that fn minus fk minus one is greater than s. So this stopping time is somehow gonna be related to the right hand side here. And we also define a stopping time t Again, it's an infimum of n greater than or equal to k. And you look at this oscillation again, but now you want it to be greater than s plus 2t. So obviously that's gonna be related to the left-hand side somehow. Then we have by definition that k is less than or equal to s everywhere because s is the infimum of n greater than or equal to k with a certain property. And s is less than or equal to t because the oscillation is going to be bigger than s before it's bigger than s plus 2t in general. So k is less than s, s is less than t or equal to. And the estimate we want, let's call it star. The estimate we want is just the probability of A intersect the set where t is finite less than or equal to 2c probability of a intersect the set where s is finite. We saw these stopping times when we were looking at these um, the dupe maximal inequalities. Um, the maximal to say that the maximal function is greater than a certain value 
S plus 2T means that for some value, the process is greater than S plus 2T, which says that this stopping time here is finite. There exists an N greater than or equal to K such that this is true. So to, to do it backwards, if this oscillation is greater than S plus 2T for some N, then the supremum over N is greater than S plus 2T. So the maximal function is greater than S plus 2T. And the same thing on the right-hand side here. So this estimate we have is really just an estimate of probabilities of certain stopping times being finite compared with each other. So let's move on from there. We fix our n greater than or equal to k. And we let a sub n be the set a intersect s equals n. So the set the subset of A where the stopping time S is equal to N, just as before, we're taking a varying stopping time and making it constant by looking at its values individually. This is contained in A sub N because S is a stopping time. This is the definition of, of S being a stopping time, essentially. Now on the set, A N intersect where T is finite, what can we say? We have that Ft minus Fn minus one. Uh, this will make sense once you see the conclusion as to why I'm looking at this. By the triangle inequality, this is greater than or equal to Ft minus Fk minus one minus Fn minus one minus Fk minus one using the triangle inequality in this sort of reverse form that always confuses me. And now, what can we say about this? S is equal to, well, by the definition of T, T is the first time where F of N, or T is the first time N where F of N minus FK minus one is greater than S plus two T. So F of T minus FK minus one is greater than S plus two T. That's just the definition of T. T is the first time that this happens. And this other term, Fn minus one minus Fk minus one, what do we have here? We're on the set where S equals N. And S is the first time where Fn minus Fk minus one is greater than S. So N minus one happens before that time. So Fn minus one minus Fk minus one has to be less than or equal to S. <laughs> you have failure of the stopping condition at time n minus one because you're one before the stopping condition. So this has to be greater than minus s because you have the thing, this part here is less than s, less than or equal to s. So you get the minus signs flip, right? And this is 2t. So what does that tell us? It tells us that the probability of the set a n, so a and also s is equal to n, intersect the set where t is finite, is actually equal to, equal to or less than or equal to? Yeah, let's say less than or equal to because that's actually correct. If you're in this set, then you know that f t minus f n minus one is greater than two t. So this set is contained in that set. So the probabilities of one is less than the probability of the other. So less than probability of an intersect t less than infinity intersect ft minus f n minus one greater than 2t. And these are the sets we know something about by our assumption, right? That's why we needed to check what this, that on this set we actually have, so on this set here, we actually have immediately some control on the oscillation with respect to the stopping time t. So our assumption tells us that this is less than or equal to 2c times the probability of a n. So what did we need here? a n is contained in the sigma algebra a n. We have that because we have this n minus one here. So we need to compare with, we need to look at the sigma algebra a sub n. We have that 
t is a stopping time with t greater than or equal to k on a n. By definition, t is always greater than or equal to k. Um, hang on. Do I want t greater than or equal to k or t greater than or equal to n? Is t greater than or equal to n? I think I've made a mistake here. Is t greater than or equal to... I should need that t is greater than or equal to n here on a and not t greater than or equal to k, right? What's happening on a n? A n is, but, um, is a n. n is s, yep. right? And t is bigger than s. Yeah, t greater than or equal to s, greater than or equal to n on a n. That's exactly right. Yep. So the assumptions are satisfied. I wrote t greater than or equal to k in my notes because I'm an idiot, right? It's t greater than or equal to n. So our assumption works. Okay. Now we sum over n greater than or equal to k. And because these a n's are a partition of, of a, you get the probability of a intersect t less than infinity. It's less than or equal to 2c, probability of a intersect s less than infinity because you're summing over all the possible values of S, all the possible finite values of S. You're not even considering the case where S is infinity. That's irrelevant here. And as I said before, that gives us the estimate we wanted to show because this estimate star here is equivalent to what we just proved. There we go. So that's the proof of lemma three. We're ready for our break. I just wanted to highlight the statement of lemma three. Here it is. So now we have some control on super level sets of the maximal function of f in terms of each other, which is giving us this nice geometric or exponential or whatever. I'm not exactly sure. This nice decay of the super level measures of the maximal function, which is telling me that maximal function can't be too large in any LP space. That's ultimately what we're going to use. Can't grow too much. 